What's going on, Chris? I am doing amazing. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. So today on this episode of Homework, we're not concentrating specifically on video conferencing. We got a specialist here today to talk about audio. I'm so excited today to talk to Shez. Uh, audio is so overlooked. I'm, you know, it's like one of those things, it's this invisible force that can affect people so dramatically, but then because it's not seen, um, I think it just goes unseen. With our generation, with millennials, we call it the vibe. That's what I see audio as, the vibe. You can go into a room and feel the mood, you can go in the room and feel the atmosphere, and oftentimes that has to do with how you sonically interact with that space. And now that we are stuck on screens all day, it's important to think, what are our ears doing at this time? We've got Shez with us, and he is a entrepreneur. He is a music genius. He's got the background. He, this man, he needs no introduction, but maybe he does. Shez, welcome to the show, man. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you guys so much for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. <clears throat> awesome. So. Chris and I are really excited to chat with you because, you know, there are a ton of people who just don't know how to adapt to our situation and what's going on. But before we getting into all the, you know, changes that have taken place, can you, you know, introduce yourself, tell us what you do and, and what's your brand about? Sure, I'll, uh, I'll do my best to give you the Coles notes, I suppose. Um, hey everyone, my name is Shaz Mera. I am a music lover turned creative entrepreneur, uh, turned producer, turned brand partnerships um, person and experiential marketing, audio branding. I play in many different worlds, but they are all coming from the same place of trying to make experiences better uh, for people, for organizations, and really for the world at large. And that, uh, that mission is, is driven through a few for-profit companies as well as a not-for-profit company that I'm building. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a music lover that has taken my passion uh, you know, for music and sound and built it into many organizations uh, that I continue to grow today. Cool. Um, so I have a question because I, I, this is our first time meeting. Uh, I would love to know how you got into this, like especially from the audio perspective, like were you a lover of music and like, um, you know, going to shows and stuff like that before, or was it from more of an artistic perspective, like sound design? I love to know like what made you, what was it, if you can think about some of the things from you know, your earlier career, like what sort of made you want to go into this? Yeah, sure. Um... I remember it distinctly. I was listening to the radio and there was a Beastie Boys track on and yeah. Mixmaster Mike was just cutting. He was scratching up records, right, on the chorus. Um, and something about that sound of a record being scratched, you know, with rhythm and with tact just grabbed me from the inside and pulled me into the world of scratching and hip hop and DJing. And I started... Uh, I started collecting vinyl records when I was, you know, nine or 10 years old. <clears throat> and, uh, and that, that led into this love affair with DJ culture and hip hop. And I would be going to DJ battles when I was really young and, and just be floored by what these people were doing by manipulating two records into a completely new sound. Um, and, you know, I bought some turntables on my 15th birthday. I treated myself to a pair of turntables and a mixer after spending years and years uh, saving towards that goal and a hobby which was DJing turned into a full-time career that's really how everything started for me it was a love affair with vinyl and with music and just really naturally grew and progressed into something much bigger which was how all of my other platforms really began to come together without me necessarily knowing what was happening obviously from in a DJ perspective it's like you can you can make people move, which is like this sorcery, right? It's almost like you can have people sort of mulling around and then you know you've got the right thing. You can cast a spell and all of a sudden you know what's going to happen. Those people are going to start to like move a little and then it's going to be like bang. So maybe if you want to talk about, um, you know, how do you translate that kind of magic of anticipating uh, changing people's responses and how does that work in, in more of a 
you know, uh, film perspective or like, like a commercial setting. Yeah. There is tremendous power in being able to control people's emotions through sound, which is what I learned firsthand by DJing. And, you know, people could be having a shitty day and you can take that all away and, and make their day better for a few hours. I went down a rabbit hole and started really getting nerdy about this stuff in terms of the psychology and the physiology of sound and how it affects human behavior um, and how you can bridge music and communications in a way that actually make the world better for people. An easy way to think about this is what if the whole world was blind? How would companies build affinity with them? How would they know that one bank is different from the other bank? They couldn't know it's the green bank versus the blue bank versus the red bank. So what would they do through sound and through audio to engage people and build a brand that people have affinity with that they realize, okay, this is the green bank that's talking to me. And this is a space, you know, that I lean into and have building in, been building in uh, over the last decade or so. In the context of ROI, like we have to sell through to CMOs, but like you guys know, CFOs as well and justifying outlandish spends that they think is, whoa, this 30 second ad is costing us this, but you're telling us, you know, this little piece or this suite of sounds is going to cost us this. How can you justify that? And we always say, look, your 30 second ad has a shelf life. It's like fruit. It's an apple or a mango. It's going to go bad after a certain time. But what we are building for you is, is intrinsically your brand personality. These assets are gold. They're diamonds. They're not going to expire. And if used over time, the ROI is tremendous because that expense now is amortized across all of your assets over years. There are a couple of amazing things that you send in there. Um, one thing I want to touch on is how in this time and in this space, the transition from live audio where you're in front of a, a crowd of people to this now interaction over the internet, how sound is playing a role or what type of role it's playing with people. I'd love to hear how you are affecting change in that way as uh, as we are doing visually i suppose at the baseline level it comes down to the way in which we interact with our world at large our homes our cars our ecosystem around us entertainment has changed so much so you know it is not a binary means of communication like it was in the 50s and 60s or even like it was 10 years ago or even five years ago things are speeding up so much faster with how technology is embedded in our lives and companies aren't planning for this change, right? They're not thinking about things in the context of audio first and the implications um, of what that means for them and their communication strategy. And one example is let's say we're watching the playoffs or the Raptors game. By the time that the commercials come on, you have various advertisers you know, screaming at you, fighting for your attention, but your attention is on your second screen. You're looking at your phone, you're on an Instagram, you're on Twitter. So now the issue becomes someone planning for and investing in producing a campaign to speak to someone through a channel, which is a visual channel and doing the media buy and so forth, really putting up a lot of money. As you guys know, you're in this business of producing content. What happens when that content doesn't get watched because the consumer or the human being's eyes are somewhere else? How can we get their eyes off the second screen back to the first screen, which is the screen we planned for and invested in to get our message across? Sound is a caveat that can help do that, right? So Tangerine had a great campaign uh, during the playoffs last year where all the ads come on, everyone's screaming, it's noisy. And then they just sort of went quiet. The screen was orange and they had this ominous sound sort of like, ah, and it kind of made you look up to the visual communication. And the copy was playoffs are stressful. Banking shouldn't have to be. And it was a great example of how they were able to pull inside of you and pull your eyes from your second screen to the first screen. Something that's interesting about sound is it sound is obviously, we hear sounds relative to the environments that we're a part of. And so we normalize sound. So if you go into a crowded space, 
you know, something loud and noisy that if it's in a crowded space, it's going to seem like it, it feels like it's there. And I think what's interesting about what you just said is that when you create stark contrasts, like um, even if it is in like a, a like subtle contrast between if you have a very um, quiet piece, the the contrast in that piece is going to seem bigger in the in the context of it. I'm interested in you know that as a concept for you know with things like Zoom and video conferencing. I find there's a huge gap with like audio notifications about what's going on. You know, like when something happens on your screen or you change things, the sound design is severely lacking because they, you know, even the idea that your sound's on or off, you don't really get any cues. Everything is visual. So how is there, in terms of UI design, is there anything you'd want to talk to that and like how you feel about what, what's best practice in terms of that? Yeah, I mean, Look, in the context of UX and UI design to enhance a customer's journey or someone's journey in interacting with a product like Zoom, or even in the context of retail now pivoting to e-commerce and direct-to-consumer, there's tremendous implications on making that journey better in ways that, again, people might not even realize, but it eases the cognitive load. It eases the dissonance. Um, you know, you're sprinkling in these Easter eggs sonically that actually add value and say something. Because I think the danger in thinking about how to build, uh, you know, communication and organi organizations through sound is that let's, let's look at it like uh, traditional creative aesthetic visual design, right? If you have a page you're not going to fill it up with design and copy for the sake of doing so. There's, there's value in white space, right? There's value in white space, just like there's value in silence. We don't want to make the, the world any noisier than it already is if we're not saying something. So what are we really saying in a noisy world? And how is what we are saying actually adding value to that journey and building our brand in the process? So to your point, yeah, there's so many examples and use cases for companies and their products, um, you know, to make that journey better, to reinforce these subtle cues. Like when you start your MacBook, there's a sound there sort of telling you that the technology is working and you can trust Apple. When you pay in the Apple store, there's a distinct sound there to tell you your payment has gone through. We don't think about these little nuances in our day-to-day -day lives, but they actually affect us in, in really important ways. And, you know, to that point, I think, um, Someone who gets this very well are the producers of television shows for kids, kids shows, right? Disney, Spin Master, Papa Pig, and so forth. They know that they might not be able to yet speak to through traditional language and communication with young minds that are two, three years old to communicate these sometimes complex emotional concepts. But they've built an ecosystem of branded sounds that they use consistently to tell their stories through. And those sounds, as subtle as they are, reinforce and drive those complex emotional concepts for these impressionable young minds. And that's what they do to drive their message across. And it works tremendously in their favor. These are all multi-billion dollar franchises. One of like, um, you know, things that I really like in sound design and films is when they do subtonal um, audio. So things that you don't recognize, but creates a, yes. uh, ex an emotional, an emotional feeling. feeling. Yeah. So like really low bass that you can't even hear necessarily, mm -hmm. but creates a sense of anxiety. Yes. And I think that there's things like that, which is sort of like color yes. uh, for film, right? Like you do the edit, uh, picture edit you, and sound design and then color is sort of like the sound design, which is not, you know, it's not the, the score, the musical score or the mm -hmm. audio of the characters, mm -hmm. but it's this it's the amb ambience or ambiance of like these things that are just there kind I of. I call it the atmosphere of the film. Yeah. Like there is the reality of the film, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what's going on dialogue, but then the atmosphere are the things that actually immerse you in that world, the sound, the color, and change those things even slightly and you get a completely different film. Oh. I'll never forget in film school, that a professor, uh, just as an experiment, we all know it's true, but until you do it, you, you don't really recognize. In the movie, he, he shuts the sound off and then plays his own soundtrack, right? And it's like this film that was so serious and like 
struck you in the heart, then you hear like this wacky music and it's like, what, what is it? Watch a horror movie with, with, you know, with the sound off. It's not going to scare you. And I think exactly. Hollywood, Hollywood and, and the film industry, you guys like they get it. You guys get it that you, you probably treat visual and sound somewhere in the realm of 50, 50, maybe 40, 60 or, or whatever. But for some reason, advertising still treats it as 90, 10. And an afterthought, yeah. An afterthought. It's always post production. They're not thinking about, you know, what happens when you when you move sound and audio to the top of the strategy and planning phase. And look, you know, there's this there's this four note Gregorian chant called this is really nerdy, but I'm gonna take it here for a second, called Dies Ire. And it's about thirteen hundred years old. And the the progression of those four notes were sung for like, you know, funerals and 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 death, and it was this really ominous, powerful chant uh, 1,300 years ago. And those notes have found themselves in every movie that we all know and love, from It's a Wonderful Life to Lord of the Rings to Star Trek, pretty ev ev The Exorcist, even Frozen 2, right, recently by Disney. In their case, they use these four notes uh, to drive the entire narrative off the storyline how that story resolves itself. Elsa's mom is calling her, but that signal call are those four notes. So it makes you feel very creepy inside. Um, and this is nothing new. This is going back and taking something from 1300 years ago. Disney leaned into that four notes to build a billion, multi-billion dollar franchise through. Those four notes are written into all of the songs on the soundtrack. What we want to understand is from your perspective, what new direction or where can we go next in sound and audio that you know podcasts kind of open the door to a whole plethora of different mediums and for uh, formations of uh, of different types of um, content but do you see any trends happening or is podcast the the height of audio uh, consumption i think we're just getting started and you're seeing you know, platforms like Spotify buy up the um, Joe Rogan podcast and so forth because they're realizing in doing so they're not only bringing an audience to their platform, but they, they understand and value um, where that content is going to go and how it's going to grow, you know, their own platform. People are listening to things more than they're reading them. Right. And Judah, I think you, you, you just touched on that. Like you can actually do other things, um, when you are listening instead of just reading or just using your eyes so you can drive you can cook you can work out you can do all this other stuff it can also augment right because like we i'm sure you've had i know you've had this for sure as being an audiophile is like when you're doing something else you're actually better when you are listening to something that you are emotionally responsive to so it's like this idea, like, you know, we know, I guess the most powerful example of that is like working out, right? Everybody's got their music or their soundtrack to their workout or, you know, anything that's, so it's like getting what they call like flow, right? So if you're working on, uh, you know, at, in our terms as if we're editing, I can listen to music if I'm not editing audio, uh, I'm just editing picture. Having a flow with music is something that like makes my, my job visually better. Uh, I don't know, is there something that you do that like, or like, what are the kind of soundtracks to your life? It's a big question. Music is, is the soundtrack to my life. So we actually believe in this so much that we built a B2B SaaS product to address background music in B2B spaces, hotels, restaurants, REITs, retail, um, because it was a massive issue, right? And we were having lunch one day at a hotel and the, the music didn't match what was happening in the hotel, it didn't match the aesthetic. We were on a patio, it's 40 to 60 year old lunch crowd, corporate lunch crowd, and they started blasting like festival style EDM to the, to the point where yeah. no, one could, no one could have a conversation anymore. And, um, you know, our server comes around and I say, can you turn it down a bit or put on something a bit more conducive to the atmosphere? Uh, look around you, like no one can have a conversation. This is really awkward. And she was super apologetic saying that there's nothing she could do, that they pay this company in the UK that manages everything. So we, we looked into this space and we realized it was a very archaic industry, you know, filled with incumbents 
Um, and we set out to build a product to challenge what was happening in that space to again, address these sort of background sonic scapes that most people don't think about, but can be tremendously impactful. Unlike going to a restaurant and having bad food and leaving a Yelp review and knowing why you had a bad experience and providing that feedback for the restaurant to iterate off of, with the sound, they might not even know why they're having a bad experience. They might not even be able to give any feedback. And that's a really dangerous place for a brand or a company to live. Personal experience, and I'm sure Judy yeah. is, of where you're doing an edit. And it looks like the content's there, everything's great, like the visuals are there, and people are just like, I don't know, I just don't like it. Yeah. And then the funniest part is that if you switch the music, they're the like, exact same visual, yeah. Same thing, everything, they're just like, oh, this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> now what if I'm lifting weights and I'm, I'm deadlifting and I'm playing really sad slow jams, breakup music? Is oh, yeah. that gonna make me lift more or is it gonna mess me up and, and throw me off, you know? Quick fire questions. Cool. Some get to know Shez, all right? So, you're a music man, let's start with the tough one. One record for the rest of your life, what would it be? Ooh, put him on the hot seat. Yeah. Um, honestly, any Sade album. Woo! Ooh. Yeah. The man knows stuff. Um, I have one for you. What's the worst sound? For me, yeah. it, for me personally, it's, it's two sounds happening at the same time. And I could be walking by and one car stereo is on and then another car stereo is playing and it's shoes in the dryer. You know, it's, it's two people fighting for my attention. And it doesn't even matter what the actual song or the sound is. The fact that maybe it's because I'm a DJ and I'm a nerd about this stuff and making sure things line up and are mixed well and are in key. But when I hear two different noises um, that are sort of polluting my brain, it drives me nuts. <laughs> all right, all right. Pac or Biggie? Uh, Biggie. Tribe Called Quest or Ghostface? You're in, you're in the hip hop era, so. Uh, oh, man. I mean, I'm gonna say Tribe just because, yeah, I'll say Tribe. I love, I love ghosts and woo. That's fair, that's fair. All right, what is your favorite place in the world? You're a world traveler. Tell us what feels like home away from home or what feels like home at all? Um, sounds cheesy, but you know, if I'm with my family, I could be anywhere and I'm good. If I'm alone and I'm traveling the world, um, I love Oslo. Last one, what would you choose, CD or cassettes? Cassettes. Um, You're you know, I still man. have all my vinyl and yes, it can get scratched and yes, it can skip and yes, it's heavy and it's a pain in the ass to, to move and deal with. But there's something to be said about the tangible aspect of touching and feeling something and it just sounds better. It's, it's warmer. When you go to sleep, what is the thing you want to like hear before you fall asleep? Nothing. Silence. 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 Yeah. It's a noisy world for me as well, you know, and there, there's value in silence. Um, you know, I will say this. I go to, as Judah knows, we, we work close to the water. I'm at the water a lot. And uh, the surf coming in and out is, is coming in and out at about 12 cycles per minute if you really stop and count. And funny enough, that is the same pace as a sleeping human in our breathing cycle. So there's a deep resonance between nature and humanity intrinsically with regards to sound and audio and how we're wired. You know, a fetus develops hearing as their first sense. They hear their mother's heartbeat in the womb. They can hear the world around them. Um, in nature, when we hear bird call and the birds chirping, intrinsically over thousands of years of evolution, we know we are safe. It is safe. The birds stop chirping, there's danger. So sound and, and humans have this long standing relationship going back thousands of years of evolution. I think we can now uh, in today's world lean into those insights um, and really design a world through sound that makes for a better human experience. I think it's really interesting to talk about human centered design because in the, in the context of healthcare and the context of mental health, um, those things, understanding those underlying biological systems or cognitive ways that we understand the world that's pre-visual pre um, or even um, unconscious is like so important. And uh, I'm wondering if like there's any exciting things that you've seen, like 
in te technology that's that's trying to you know go into that. Um, I know there's like work with like three D sound like that's coming out, and I don't know if that's something that's exciting for you. Yeah, we uh, we're working on a couple of projects right now for eight D design. It's called right for in the context of VR and AR and uh, VR. The issue with VR is that visually it puts you in this context and space but the sound didn't always necessarily match that visual experience and that dissonance was again why after 20 30 minutes of being in that vr experience we would feel off and we would have to take off those headsets and i think that is now being solved through sound design you got an elevator pitch you want people to know why sound is important and what has changed, especially in this time. What would you do in terms of designing your communications or your brand interactions, or your messaging, if the entire world was blind? If it was only audio first, which is really becoming the case, not that people are becoming blind, but people are tuning out visual stimuli more so and leaning into audio first platforms to navigate their lives in the context of things like podcasts and Spotify, but also in the context of smart homes and ecosystems and cars to control their lives, Siri and Alexa and so forth. So instead of just advertising through these new technological platforms that are presenting themselves, think about designing a human experience that actually builds affinity and enhances that engagement with your brand or your company or the communications that you're putting out. And all of these things that we've discussed are applicable omni-channel. It's applicable across, across you know, film and television and radio and paid media and social and UX and UI sounds and hold music. You know, we have a whole thought process on even how you can strategically build your hold music to decrease fatigue and anxiety in someone that's already calling you that's frustrated from the offset. So all mm -hmm. of these considerations is like, you can apply thoughtful sound design and audio first strategies to all of the channels that you operate across. And, and that's a powerful thing. If there's congruency in your strategy there and it lines up with your visual identity, your copy, your personality, and everything else that you've been doing as a brand for decades already, you have a powerful trifecta of on-brand communications that is consistent and people inherently recognize as your company or your brand. And it builds more recall and trust over time and really, that's, that's the challenge that, you know, we're putting out to companies is saying now it's already late, but if you haven't been thinking about it, now is definitely the time to start planning your communication strategy multi-channel with putting audio first. What does that mean for you? How can it help your customers? How can it move the bottom line for your company? Amazing. Cool. Chez Mira. That was an amazing conversation. You seem to have such an amazing ability to anticipate people's emotional responses through sound. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, man, that was amazing. Take care, guys. Thank you. Guys, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like. Obviously, this is a really important conversation and we're gonna be having a lot more of these with some great interviewees. Uh, so please hit the notification bell because we're gonna be putting a lot more out. And we're glad that you're here watching. Thank you for the support. See you next time. Bye.